Welcome to Toot Your Own Horn, Music Matters. I am here today with a very old friend and someone who I'm very excited to have on this podcast, Cindy, Cindy Nichols. How are you, Cindy Nichols? I'm very well, thank you. <laughs> I have known you, Cindy, for so long, and you are a remarkable person on so many fronts in terms of how I see you in the music world and community. And I think your story, no matter what it is, is going to be just fantastic. Would you be so kind as to tell us how you started to play your instrument and why you chose it? Wow. How far back do you want me to go? My, I want my you first to go music. like before you, I want to like, the, I want the whole story of the, the how you thing. actually picked it and all that. Well, I, I first started um, noticing music when I was in kindergarten and my little best friend who lived across the street from school took piano lessons. And so there was a piano in the house and I was fascinated with it. Um, she was playing and I would ask if she would teach me what she was doing. So I had this early fascination and I begged my parents for a piano. And of course that wasn't coming. Um, so um, it was a little later that um, my grandmother, um, my, my grandparents lived in Tomahawk, Wisconsin and my grandmother was a church organist and they had a little music shop um, next to the church. So they lived there, she had the shop there, and then she'd go to church and come back. Um, it was a very fun place to visit when I was a kid in the summer. And she taught me how to write notes on the staff, what notes are, um, how to represent rhythm. I was mm, third grade, fourth grade, maybe. And she was, as a, the, the keyboard on an organ is just big. And she was a wonderful organist. So she, every summer when we used to go up and see her, she would teach me more. So by the time fifth grade came around, um, I, I really wanted to play the clarinet. How I picked it, I think some of my friends played it and I thought it was cool. I didn't start in fifth grade. I could have, but my teacher at the time in fifth grade was a a big uh, disciplinarian and she didn't treat the kids very well who left for band and had to come back. So I just stayed away from that for a little bit. But um, then I, so I taught, I started um, in sixth grade and from the minute I played it, it was magic. It was something I actually could do easily. I was surprised. I, there was a lot of things that, other people around me were having problems doing that I could do. So I, I, you know, I would, I played it. I loved it. My teachers were amazing. My middle school teacher who took me under his wing and ended up being my mentor um, just made band so much fun and a challenge. And when I was in seventh grade, I, you know, I had to move up the clarinet section, took me to, ninth grade but I had to be first year and I'm one of those people that that has motivated me in school you know I didn't want to do it halfway I was all in or nothing type person so my I mean my childhood with music was just one wonderful uh, new thing at a time after another the people the the um, people who saw that I was one of those teachable people um and and lord knows we were just a middle class suburban chicago family um I, my dad used to have me t practice in the basement because he didn't like this well there really was never squeaking but he would prefer me in the basement practicing hmm. but i know i i did not get a lot of support from my dad when I was young, um, it was until I was in high school by the time he realized that I was doing something that might interest him. But you know how that goes. My mom made up for everything as she did always. Um, so I had I had a wonderful time in, in high school. Um, we had wonderful com compose conductors who really introduced me to a lot of the great, great um, works of, of the, um, of band literature and also I played a lot of Brahms and Hinesley transcriptions when I was in high school. So I heard a lot of orchestral music, 
I was also in orchestra in, in middle school and high school, um, which I really loved. I didn't get necessarily to play all the time in middle school. Obviously, there wasn't a lot of full orchestra things. But when I got to high school, I also got to play E-flat clarinet. And that was the bomb for me, for sure. And that's something I, I loved all my life and finally ended up getting my own E-flat and, and playing it happily. Um, so that that's kind of how I started. Hmm. What's fascinating about it is that you seem to have multiple people along the way who adored helping you in various different parts of it, but not... Yes the same part of it, like all kind of different. Yeah, I think, and I think that's what I, I would love people to look for. If you're a, a mom or a dad and, and you've got a very precocious five-year-old, like I was, um, although they didn't have any idea, I wasn't sure what was going on at the time, but I showed a lot of interest in music early and, uh, like I said, I begged for a piano and in our 90, 900 square foot house that, I mean, I even offered to sleep on it, take my bed out of my, <laughs> but it, it was something that um, I just had the right help at the right time in the right order. Um, I certainly didn't come from some magical musical family where everybody played an instrument and I, they, you know, everybody played, um, uh, classical music on the radio all the time. I had to fight for it mm -hmm. too. I think that was a, a difference too. Um, but don't don't ignore your children who are looking at things consistently and showing talent or interest. Um, I know people look for this in sports for their children, but I'm I'm not sure there's a where for musical or or other art type things. But you're right. There was there was somebody there for me every every step of the way. Yeah, I, I agree, though, with what you just said, that the second half of what you were saying, too, as well, is that, you know, in my history as a shop owner, I've had parents call me where they have said, my kid has bothered me about this for a year or, you know, they keep asking me about the bass clarinet or they keep asking me about getting, trying the clarinet. And I've kind of and they and the parents that I find the coolest are the ones who will say, and I've blown my kid off. But you know what? I'm not going to do that anymore because they just won't give up. And so I finally decided to figure it out and I'm buckling down and I'm looking around. Right. And it's it's really weird. But I do think that kids have a very peculiar attraction sometimes to something that actually is made to stick. Mm -hmm. You know, that it isn't it isn't a whim. And, and, I, and for piano, I think I would have been a concert pianist. Mm -hmm. If that had, had, if that had I, happened. If that had happened, if, um, cause I was really started with piano and had that, had they taken my bed out of my room and given me a piano, I, I know I would have pursued piano cause that would have been my first way to get into it. Now, I don't have any idea if I would have ended up playing clarinet, but that's, um, it's interesting when I think of what if. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is interesting. And it's interesting that you had help because a lot of times I think when people come to music, they struggle because it's not only the physical aspect of playing the wind instrument, because there's all that, right? Like what's in my mouth and how do I deal with this? You know, then there's also the learning to count and to play in time and to like having to read the music and all of those things can be very overwhelming if you are a perfectionist or you are very particular or you are, you know, when you think of little kids and some of their traits are older, you know, older people, just kind of our traits. Some of those things, if they're not broken down so that they come in bite-sized packages can be very off-putting for those of us who want to accelerate and think we should be doing better or whatever it is. Right. <laughs> you know, well, I know as a, as a teacher myself, um, many of many students I had were overwhelmed with, I'm not sure that I can think about what's in my mouth and think about learning notes and think about learning rhythm. And for me, I got that broken down before I ever got my own instrument. So when I started playing the clarinet, it wasn't a question of learning how to read notes, where they are on staff, because um, my grandmother had already shown me that. I, I think I, I got better at it, certainly, but 
I, I was just playing the clarinet when I when I came to it. And as luckily for me, it was easy mm -hmm. for me. I know that sound, you know, I put the horn in my mouth and it, you know, I, I got a decent sound out of it from the very start. So mm -hmm. Yeah. And I do think that makes a difference because I played the piano too for a little while. And then I, cause I learned how to read music before I played the clarinet. Cause I'm not sure I would have been good at all of that all at once. I think yeah. broken down matters. And I think that for anyone listening, I think that if you are sincere about starting to see the benefits from listening to these podcasts of all these people who I, who I know and love, it's saying over and over again, how much benefit they get from it. I think you need to think about ways that you can take baby steps to help yourself feel good about the experience. And that might yeah. be like, I, you know, some, maybe you sing at first and then maybe you, or maybe you play the piano at first or, you know, but there's something magical about playing a wind instrument, I think. Yeah. I think it's a question of, um, you are the vessel for the composer to get the message out to the audience. And if you look at it that way, um, you've got to get past all of the notes and the amateur and the, all those things before you can really make music. But there's such an, a human aspect to playing a wind instrument um, because there's so many ways you can change the airflow. I mean, change your fingers. Change, there's so, it's so dynamic. Um, and it's, I think for a lot of kids, it's a way to express their feelings that maybe uh, wouldn't be acceptable otherwise. I know I have had many male students, you know, through the years who really weren't in touch with their feelings, but they could put those feelings into a clarinet where it was safe to be more vulnerable. And I think that's really an important thing because it, it, did, it did a lot for me as far as my self-confidence and, um, you know, getting up. I've never, I never really had a problem getting up and speaking in front of people because I played in front of people all the time. And I, I think it really made a difference. It gave me a, a life because I never, ever thought of doing anything else but teaching the clarinet. Hmm. That's really interesting. Yeah, I, I said that actually, too. And uh, when I did this podcast with just myself, that I really feel like one of the things that music gives you that is so incredibly important, especially right now, um, in where we are in our world is an ability to completely express yourself and not fear retribution, not fear um, anyone attacking you in any way or oh, any nothing. nothing like you, you can totally safely express yourself. And you're, you're, you become a part of a very small part of something bigger than yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's not just learning patience and, and teamwork and all the things that being in a rehearsal setting um, teaches you about life and things. It's all transferable. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it, you know, it is, it is something that um, I, I see beneficial in all for all children um, I think everybody should play the piano in second, in second grade to, you know, just be exposed. A lot of it is exposure. Kids will gravitate towards things if, if, they're, if they're exposed. But again, if they're just exposed to football or, or um, soccer or, you know, every child, I, in my humble opinion, um, would benefit from having a musical outlet of some kind. You know, maybe it's church choir um, and a sport. I do believe some everybody needs something physical to do, but I don't think it's an it, it's an either. I think it's it's a both. Yeah, and I think that that same rule in terms of like thinking about what's good for you kind of rule, I think applies to adults. I I, I just feel like there's so many adults out there that you know um, whether they whatever their whatever their foibles are whatever we as humans struggle with right that they don't turn to some of the very practical holistic easy low hanging fruit kinds of things to help them become more congruous and feel better about themselves and i do think that participating in an art form and in particular music and i think a physical sport are two basic things that you can um adhere to like you can hold it as a mantra or like you're you're gonna hang on to this right you know and it's something you can do for yourself to be able to see your own growth yeah yeah it's so grounding i think 
um, especially as as adults as well. I can't I can't tell you how many adults I've taught over my career that always wanted to play the clarinet but didn't or used to play and want to get back into playing again. And I think a lot of them are seeking the same things that we we see in music. Um, just something that they loved, used to love, used to be good at, and want to have those happy feelings again. Because I really do think it is something that um, if, if you're good, if, if you're good at it, or even if you're not necessarily first chaired good, that there's some really happy feelings, happy memories, certainly, of um, playing in an, an instrument and being a part of it again, mm -hmm. or even for your own enjoyment. Well, and I think it opens you up to a world of less judgment. There was a, a girl I remember singing um, that I won't name who really couldn't sing in tune. And the judgment in me wanted to say, oh, she's not singing in tune. But she loved to sing. She just loved to sing. And it it almost helped me realize that that you know who cares if she can sing a tune even though that's it's a painful thing either. to say it was it was realizing that she brought her so much joy and because it brought her so much joy it brought others around her joy because she was very comfortable singing out a tune and it wasn't because she was defiant or or not willing she couldn't hear it yeah. it was never yeah. going to get fixed and it, and it wasn't for a lack of trying on her part, because eventually people did, I did hear people talk to her about it. She just couldn't hear herself sing well enough, even though she loved to sing. She could feel the vibration in her body and in her face and the breath support, and it made her feel alive and it made her connect the dots and feel really engaged. It just wasn't very good, but that didn't negate the people around her who enjoyed her or her own enjoyment of it. And that is a hard thing as a professional musician, when you see somebody who is, you know, for lack of a better word, floundering <laughs> in one way or another, that um, it's not, music is not something that's only for the professional, mm -hmm. for the person who can, can play it well, uh, nobody else should even try, um, you know, you're, you either got it or you don't. Um, I've had so many students over the years who were perfectly happy sitting in the third clarinet section and um, and got sometimes more out of it than the kids who were really successful. So that is it, it really is true that, you know, you don't have to be good to necessarily experience the wonder of music and the joy it brings you. Yeah. I, I think that when, when it comes to adult learners, though, I think part of the problem is they think that it's not for them because they don't have friends who do it or because it means having to step out of their comfort zone and be a beginner at something. Or I'm not sure. What do you think is the reason why they don't jump more into this as a hobby? I think um, they don't have their moms to tell them to practice. <laughs> I mean, clearly, because all of my adult students I've had, none of them, as adults, they they can't see it as a beginner would of, of the curiosity. They don't have that curiosity um, and the, 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 you know, the magic of the new learning. They have learned a lot. They're in a different place in their life. And, you know, I, I used to tell my students, you know, I can take your money, but you're going to have to practice. I don't your lessons should not be like listening to you practice. You'll need to spend time. And a lot of them just couldn't fit that into their life somehow. You know, they have a job or they've got a family or, you know, it was a, just to, or they get discouraged easily. It was just something they I don't couldn't know. do. Like, I, it makes me wonder, are those really valid reasons? And I'm not saying everybody, you know, it's a choice, obviously. But I have had so many adults, like, there's an adult that bought a clarinet, a professional instrument, came in. He, he bought something cheaper and then wound up buying something better. But he is a secure, a high-level security person. He helps a major bank downtown solve their security issues from a technology standpoint. And he is so addicted to playing the clarinet that when they have their staff meetings in the morning, he puts himself on mute and he plays long tones. Whoa, that's hardcore. And they all know at his work that he does this. 
They all know. Be, and the, it, because it's just updates, like stuff he doesn't have to like be completely, like he can still hear what they're saying. Because you know, if you play a long tone, you can actually still hear and observe everything around you. If you're playing very quiet and you're just, because I say, how do you do that? And he's like, I can do both. He goes, I just play a long tone and I'm listening to them talk and they know I'm doing this and I mute myself so they can't hear me. But it's a way that I get my practice in in the morning. And I'm just like amazed at his ingenuity for having a full-time job, wanting to learn and becoming very, very curious about this instrument. instrument when he had no experience he was really outside his box nobody played an instrument nobody in his family plays an instrument he's just a very curious person and he decided he was going to figure this out and he got it all figured out and lined up in his job and how he could how he could play on his lunch breaks and I think it is a lot of ingenuity isn't it it is right yeah it's, it's I don't, like I, yeah I don't see a lot of people having that kind of ingenuity um but what, wow, how wonderful for him. How wonderful for the people he works with. Who yeah, to be, and to be yeah. exposed to it and to like, you know, and to see his enthusiasm, like he talks to you about playing a low E as if it was like the Holy Grail coming or something like, you know what I mean? Like he's super excited about this big, dark sound he gets. And he loves talking about what it sounds, the sounds he's able to get out of the instrument. Right. And to me, that is part of the magic of it is kind of coming to a place where, and maybe singing is a good way to start is that, you know, Mr. Marcellus in uh, my education made me sing. And for two years as part of our study, if I, we wanted to study with him and I really really do feel like singing taught me something else about the clarinet. And certainly singing and understanding the interior of your mouth that many times will influence vowels. Um, I mean, I know that's not necessarily something you'd learn in seventh grade, but I think that understanding of air and the breath and the support, because that's all what you need for wind instruments. It's the yeah. same kind of support. And I think so many people struggle with the support aspect that they're just not sure where it's coming from. I mean, they'll say, use your diaphragm. Well, the diaphragm is not a, um, you know, a, a, a muscle that you can just pull out and use. Um, but if you're, if you're practicing with your legs out, not only will you get great abs, but you'll also support the air correctly. Mm-hmm. So I think, yeah, I think singing is a wonderful, you know, singing, it's your first instrument, it's attached to you. And children are so curious about that. And they, they sing all the time. And Christmas yeah. carols and all those things, even happy birthday, you know, those are opportunities. Yeah. And, you know, that's a good place to start, I think, in terms of learning a wind instrument. If somebody was listening to this podcast and said, this is really cool, I, will, I, I would consider doing this. What would you try to tell them to persuade them to do it like right now? Like jump in. You're not getting any younger. <laughs> but it, it's just, it, you know, it's so much fun. It There's so many things that you would not expect that comes from being a musician of any kind, the adult child, it doesn't matter, that there are um, things that it does to your self-confidence, your personality. Um, you know, I, I, I think if you're going to start to want to play, I mean, I think it's really important you have a good teacher help you. I don't think it's something that most people can pick up and, um, necessarily do it on YouTube only. I, I suppose some people have done that. But I think a teacher right there with you is a really important investment. Um, also, I think it's a good a, a good idea to have good equipment. It doesn't necessarily have to be the most expensive thing. But I think a lot of kids and adults um, have, struggle because of their instrument or because of their reeds or their mouthpiece or anything that helps you as a wind, you know, as a wind instrument, they just have, you know, inferior things they're working with. They're giving themselves something else to overcome. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that if you are going to start a teacher and uh, good equipment is a great way to really benefit from the hobby mm -hmm. and yeah. to explore all the sounds you can make. And that I always thought, even very young, that the better I got, the more fun I had. Mm -hmm. 
You know, I couldn't wait to go, oh, I want to be able to play that. What do I have to do to play that? Well, I practiced for that next level. And then when I got there, it was like, oh, there's another one. Okay, what do I need to do that? And that was something for me that was always pursuing the next thing. I was always looking forward to the next thing. And I think that's a good way to be in learning anything um, is to, to look at learning like that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really finding those people around you who will nurture you and support you. They might be at the music store. They might be at the repair shop, right? They might be your uncle, aunt. They might be a cousin. They might be your best friend. Um, don't be afraid to latch on to whoever will say, yeah, let's do this or let, let me help you do this. And Yeah, or let me show you how I do it. mm And -hmm. you might like it too. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I remember sitting in one of my friend's bedrooms for a sleepover. And um, one of my friends was a flute player. One of them played bass clarinet. And then it was me. And we would switch instruments and teach Oh, each fun. other. And it was fun. It really Yeah. was. And it's it's a different thing. You don't have to go always to the bar after work, right? It's a different kind of social activity. You know, it's a different way to communicate and to build a relationship. And it's new people. And so in a lot of situations, it would be people that you don't typically hang out with. Um, and so, you know, if you're curious about how you can find groups, call the music store, call the high school and ask who teaches the, the lessons for the wind instruments that are you're most interested in, right? And then set up a time to talk to that person and see if you can make a connection. Uh, you know, it needs to be a connection with somebody you like, that you feel like you could learn something from and that you aren't going to enjoy that experience. But that's true of anybody that you study privately with. That's, that's whether you're 10 years old or you're 70, you need to find somebody who you like. Exactly, that you feel um, safe with and that they have your int better, you know, your interest in mind. Right. And that you'll enjoy asking them silly questions and making and trying to make sounds in front of them and having them help you do that so that it becomes a fun activity for you. And then your world starts to blossom when you start to feel like there's a few people in your corner trying to cheer you on because it changes you. It, it does. And it, it's so, it feels so good um, when you have supportive people who are, are thrilled for you and want to help and support you and come and see you or um, help enable you to do that thing you want to do. Yeah, it's really well, well worth it. You know, friends and family at the beginning is, is really important and they still remain important as you get older and there you're always there in your, in your court. Cindy Lou Nichols, thank you so much for spending time with me. I cannot thank you enough for being on Toot Your Own Horn Music Matters. People are going to enjoy this podcast. Thank you for having me. Oh, for sure. Hugs and kisses to you. I'll see. I talk to you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye.